Las ganancias de unos pocos pueden ser más importantes que la salud y la vida de las poblaciones. Esta es una pregunta que muchos nos empezamos a hacer frente al colapso de los sistemas de salud en el mundo. Es que además del negacionismo criminal de algunos, durante años todos los gobiernos vaciaron los sistemas de salud. Se mercantilizaron al máximo las áreas de ciencia y tecnología y hoy en día el mundo enfrenta la pandemia con una salud mayormente privatizada, a la que solo unos pocos tienen acceso. La realidad es que las pandemias para los trabajadores son dos, el COVID-19 y el sistema capitalista. Por eso, cientos de organizaciones de más de 30 países impulsamos una declaración internacional por un sistema único de salud, público, gratuito y de acceso universal. Porque sabemos que una salud privatizada no garantiza atender a los más necesitados, ni tampoco garantiza nuestra seguridad. Porque es necesario centralizar toda la capacidad instalada de salud de los países para enfrentar al virus de forma coordinada y eficiente. Y también declarar de utilidad social los laboratorios y monopolios farmacéuticos para impulsar la producción pública de medicamentos, respiradores, insumos de protección y todo lo que haga falta. Los capitalistas pretenden ajustarnos y quitarnos derechos poniendo a la crisis del coronavirus como excusa. No lo podemos permitir. Se necesita un verdadero plan de emergencia en favor de los trabajadores que arranque de un aumento del presupuesto en salud en base al no pago de las deudas e impuestos reales a las grandes fortunas. Garantizar elementos de protección y seguridad para todos los trabajadores, testeos masivos al personal de salud y que se garanticen las licencias pagando el salario completo. Nuestra salud, nuestros derechos, no sus ganancias. Un modelo socialista de salud es posible y necesario. La lucha y la organización de la clase obrera es el camino. Adri tu firma. Sumate a la campaña por un sistema único de salud público, gratuito y universal. Hola, bienvenidos a una nueva emisión de Panorama Internacional, el programa de la Liga Internacional Socialista. Quédense hasta el final. Tenemos un programa muy interesante donde vamos a abordar diversos temas y una entrevista exclusiva con nuestros compañeros de Alternativa Socialista de Australia. No se lo pierdan. Quería comenzar el programa con un saludo muy especial a las enfermeras y enfermeros. El 12 de mayo se conmemoró el Día Internacional de la Enfermería. Son los que nos cuidan, pero al mismo tiempo son los que los obligan a ir a trabajar sin las condiciones mínimas de seguridad. Por eso son los que más se enferman, los que más están muriendo en esta pandemia. Los gobiernos los condenan a ir sin medidas de seguridad, pero también a cobrar salarios miserables. Muchos de ellos tienen que trabajar en dos o tres lugares para poder llegar a fin de mes. En solidaridad con las y los trabajadores de la salud y con todos los trabajadores, estamos realizando una campaña internacional exigiéndole a los gobiernos las medidas de seguridad necesaria para que ningún trabajador ponga en riesgo su vida. Y también la necesidad de poner en pie un sistema único de salud público y gratuito, incorporando a ese sistema a la salud privada, que solo le interesa el lucro. Todos los recursos tienen que estar puestos al servicio de atender la salud de la mayoría de la población. Esta campaña ya cuenta con la firma de sindicatos, activistas, organizaciones políticas de más de 30 países. Es una iniciativa conjunta entre trabajadores y organizaciones de Brasil y de Argentina que la Liga Internacional Socialista ha tomado y está impulsando en todos los lugares donde tiene organizaciones donde tiene militancia. Te pedimos que impulses la declaración, que se la lleves a los lugares de trabajo, a los sindicatos donde vos actuás, a las distintas organizaciones en las que te moves. Si querés la declaración y todavía no la tenés, podés verla en la página de la Liga Internacional Socialista. Ahora vamos a, a charlar un ratito con un compañero que ha sido fundador de un medio alternativo de enorme importancia en un proceso revolucionario como fue eh, la rebelión bolivariana. Estamos hablando de Gonzalo Gómez y, y de una fecha muy importante. Se cumplen 18 años de la fundación de Aporrea. Aporrea surgió en Internet el 14 de mayo del año 2002, prácticamente un mes después de los acontecimientos del de 11 al 13 de abril. Surgimos eh, como medio de expresión 
de un espacio de articulación de movimientos populares venezolanos, de los barrios, de grupos, de organizaciones, movimientos fundamentalmente de la Gran Caracas, que se llamó Asamblea Popular Revolucionaria. De ahí viene el nombre de Aporrea. Y surgió cuando teníamos la percepción de que venía un golpe de Estado y desde la perspectiva del movimiento popular, el Estado no estaba respondiendo eh, como era necesario. Y nos articulamos para organizar la resistencia y la movilización. Eh, la página no, puedo, no pudo aparecer sino un mes después, pero fue creada la misma noche del golpe eh, para hacer frente pues, a, a, al gobierno que se estaba instalando y que fue derribado dos días después por la movilización popular. Claro, nosotros también estábamos interviniendo en la calle. Esa Asamblea Popular Revolucionaria emitió un volante de convocatoria para formar un tapón popular en Miraflores para sostener al gobierno de Chávez y para sostener las conquistas de la Revolución Bolivariana. Eh, y después nos dedicamos, cuando surgió la página, fundamentalmente a promover la realización de un encuentro nacional de organizaciones populares con Chávez para discutir la etapa post-golpe y para discutir el programa de la revolución y cuáles eran las propuestas del movimiento popular venezolano. En este marco surgieron asambleas en los barrios, eh, empezaron a aparecer eh, eh, comunicadores populares, reporteros populares espontáneos que enviaban su información desde las movilizaciones, desde las actividades y las luchas. Y así se fue convirtiendo más por eh, lo que sucedió en la realidad que por nuestros propios planes en lo que dio lugar a Porrea como medio de comunicación popular y alternativo de, de noticias y de opinión. ¿eh? Ese es esencialmente el surgimiento de Aporrea, que hoy en día hay visiones distintas. Este, hay algunos que continúan eh, creyendo en el gobierno y en el rumbo que se ha tomado y hay otros que discrepan totalmente y que tienen un enfoque muy distinto, pero eso se sigue manifestando en la página. En Venezuela se trata de mantener todo en el marco de la polarización. Es decir, eh, irrita todo aquello que se sale eh, de lo que está concebido pues, como la propaganda oficial. Lo que hace la oposición, sobre todo difundido a través de los medios privados, del capital privado, y lo que hace el gobierno a través de sus televisoras, de sus periódicos, de sus emisoras de radio. Entonces quedamos nosotros como un reducto ¿eh? de una opinión diversa, plural, propia, además de base del movimiento popular, en Aporrea tiene posibilidades de escribir cualquiera. Eso hace que se escapen muchas cosas que no quisieran ser huidas, que no quisieran que se difundan, ¿eh? que no quisieran que se sepan, eh, que molestan a uno u otro lado. Estamos como en un sándwich, ¿no? porque la oposición dice que somos chavistas y que somos funcionales al gobierno. Y los sectores del gobierno dicen que nosotros somos traidores, oposición, que somos de la CIA, etcétera, ¿no? Por supuesto que en nuestra página no se habla a favor de la CIA y a favor del imperialismo. Es una página antiimperialista, una página de los revolucionarios, una página de los que tienen una visión de izquierda, pero un espectro súper amplio, súper amplio, ¿no? Eh, este tipo de comunicación, en lugar de fomentarla, de desarrollarla, de que avanzase en el país hacia la socialización, ha sido más bien restringida, coartada, mmm, cerrando todas las posibilidades de financiamiento, bloqueando la señal en Internet, ¿eh? Este, haciéndonos campaña en medios de comunicación del Estado en contra, señalándonos eh, de manera difamatoria, ¿no? Aún habiendo allí este, compañeros claramente eh, chavistas que incluso los podemos considerar simpatizantes de, del, del gobierno actual. Pero bueno, hay otros ¿eh? que están en otra línea, pues que no reconocen al gobierno actual como un gobierno revolucionario, que más bien consideran que ha destruido la revolución, consideran que es otra derecha, consideran que le está abriendo el camino a la derecha tradicional y que ha permitido que el imperialismo haya podido hacer con Venezuela todo lo que está haciendo. Bueno, este, y que es responsable de las políticas que en Venezuela se aplican. Aporrea es www.aporrea.org. Eh, nos parece muy importante difundirlo, hacer saber de nuestra existencia y de las dificultades que tenemos 
y poder eh, obtener todo el apoyo necesario para seguir cumpliendo esta labor. Otra fecha muy importante de la semana que pasó tiene que ver con la Segunda Guerra Mundial. El 7 de mayo se cumplieron 75 años de la entrada triunfal del Ejército Rojo a Berlín. Esto marcó el fin del nazismo y el triunfo de los aliados en Europa. Pocos días antes se suicidaba Hitler, era asesinado en Italia Mussolini. Tres meses después terminaba la Segunda Guerra Mundial, después de la masacre del genocidio provocado por el imperialismo yanqui al tirar dos bombas nucleares en Hiroshima y Nagasaki. La Segunda Guerra Mundial, al igual que la primera, fue una guerra imperialista. Fallecieron entre 50 y 70 millones de habitantes, una verdadera carnicería, el 2,5% de la población mundial. A diferencia de la Primera Gran Guerra, en esta, además de la disputa interimperialista, la existencia del fascismo implicó un plan contrarrevolucionario para destruir el primer Estado obrero de la historia, la Unión Soviética, y también las libertades democráticas conquistadas en más de 100 años de lucha por parte de la clase obrera y los pueblos del mundo. Esto, a su vez, generó una enorme resistencia revolucionaria por parte de los trabajadores y una extendidísima vanguardia en infinidad de países. Ellos fueron los verdaderos héroes que derrotaron al fascismo. La derrota del nazismo comenzó en Stalingrado, dos años antes de la entrada del Ejército Rojo en Berlín. Ya para esa época los aliados habían comenzado a recuperar Italia. Del 43 al 45 existió un pacto contrarrevolucionario de hecho entre la Unión Soviética de Stalin, Gran Bretaña y Estados Unidos. La prioridad dejó de ser derrotar al nazismo, ya en retirada, y pasó a ser derrotar de manera contrarrevolucionaria el ascenso revolucionario que se estaba extendiendo en infinidad de países. De hecho, se abrió la posibilidad de una derrota catastrófica del capitalismo y el terror frente a eso los unió a todos. En Italia, Francia, Grecia y en gran cantidad de países, la caída del nazismo dejó el poder en manos de la resistencia y de los trabajadores. Contra ellos se desató una feroz represión por parte de los aliados con la colaboración del Partido Comunista. Los pactos de Yalta y Potsdam que sucedieron al fin de la Segunda Guerra Mundial, implicaron no solo una división del mundo, sino también un plan unificado para derrotar la revolución que estaba comenzando. Pese a todo esto, en un tercio de la humanidad se terminó expropiando la burguesía, entre ellos a uno de los países más poblados de la Tierra, China. Pero esta será otra historia que contaremos en otro programa. En estos días ha surgido la noticia de que un grupo de intelectuales y políticos estarían conformando una nueva internacional llamada Internacional Progresista. En realidad esta iniciativa no es nueva, surgió en el 2018 a partir de una iniciativa de Bernie Sander y Barufaki, el que fuera ministro de Economía de Siriza, quienes figuran en el staff impulsor de todo esto. Muchos han sido gobierno hasta hace muy poquito, algunos lo siguen siendo actualmente, de gobierno que de progresista podríamos decir que tienen poco, eh, y otros se preparan para hacerlo. Por ejemplo, entre... Entre los adherentes figuran Fernando Haddad del PT, o sea, candidato derrotado por Bolsonaro, Correa, Álvaro Linera, Alicia Castro, dirigente de la burocracia sindical argentina de otras épocas. Hay una ministra incluso actual del gobierno de Alberto Fernández, eh, Gómez Alcorta, ministra de la, de la Mujer. Eh, también está la primer ministro de Islandia, es decir, si tenemos en cuenta quiénes son los personajes, nos podemos dar cuenta de que en realidad es un plan para mostrar que el progresismo aparentemente sería una salida ante la derecha o la extrema derecha, cuando muchos de estos gobiernos, precisamente porque se transformaron en gestores del capitalismo, en gestores del neoliberalismo cuando fueron gobiernos, terminaron abriéndole la puerta a esas derechas que ahora dicen que van a intentar enfrentar. No se puede humanizar el capitalismo, es falso que esté planteado volver al estado de bienestar, como plantea esta gente, es falso que se pueda combatir al autoritarismo, que se pueda combatir a las derechas que en muchos lugares del mundo surgen defendiendo un programa que no toca en lo esencial la estructura capitalista de nuestros países. Por eso no son una alternativa para los trabajadores y sectores populares que vienen peleando. La única alternativa viable a un sistema capitalista en crisis que no tiene reformas es el socialismo. Y esta gente está a años luz 
de levantar un programa de salidas de fondo, un programa socialista. Defienden la propiedad privada como medio fundamental de subsistencia de este sistema. Por eso no proponen ni dejar de pagar las deudas, ni proponen revertir las políticas de privatizaciones, nacionalizar la banca, el comercio interior, impuestos progresivos a las riquezas. No, lo que proponen es pequeñas reformas para que todo siga igual y por eso tenemos que decir, lamentablemente, a aquellos que se hayan ilusionado de que esto es más humo y lamentablemente detrás hay alguna gente interesante, algún que otro intelectual que se presta para darle cobertura a esta falsa alternativa en un mundo en crisis donde la izquierda y el socialismo cada vez más va a seguir avanzando. Ahora les vamos a presentar una entrevista muy interesante. Vamos a hablar con Mike Astrom, que es el dirigente de Socialist Alternative de Australia el partido más importante de la izquierda revolucionaria en este país. Presten atención. Mike, ¿podrías contarnos cómo los afectó la pandemia? Well, like most western countries, the you know, Australian ruling class had very much run down expending on healthcare and so on over the last few decades, and what had been one of the best healthcare systems in the world in public sector and so on, is that de had definitely been cut back. So there was every chance when the uh, virus and the pandemic hit that the system could be overwhelmed here. The Australian ruling class and, well, the working class too, had the advantage of living in an island content. Once they, uh, and hesitatingly, eventually imposed travel bans, first on China, that, that has obviously uh, played an important role in limiting the spread of the virus here. And, um, you know, there, so there's been nothing like you know, the death toll in America or France or Britain and so on. The ruling class originally, as I said, hesitated and didn't like the idea. And the extent that cases got in, they put, imposed a travel ban on China, but they delayed putting one on Italy and on uh, the US, where most of the cases were coming in from. Now, they've done that, but now, the, the, you know, they, they're flattened, what they flat, call flatten the curve, but they've explicitly rejected any uh, policy of actually eliminating the virus, uh, which I think there was the potential to do in Australia and in New Zealand, uh, to just containing it. And now the ruling class are very much demanding opening up the economy again. And so, you know, so they've had some success, uh, but, uh, but as they start to open up over the next month or two, there's every prospect as has happened in China and in South Korea and in Singapore and so on, uh, that the virus can get back in and potentially the second wave can be worse than that. Um, so that's the healthcare situ uh, situation with it. But obviously then there's the economic situation because of the impact on the very important industries in Australia, tourism, which is a major industry and, and particularly tourists from Asia and China and so on, um, the education sector, Uh, again, a very major industry here. Australia has a huge number of international students. This is a major industry. Hundreds of thousands of students from India and China and so on, or over a million uh, here. So this has all been cut back. So there's been sharp recession. The ruling class have put money in to try to bail out industry and limit it, and they increased the unemployment benefit. They doubled it. It had been very low previously. They doubled it. So in the short run, Uh, they've tried to take measures to contain things, but they're only promising to do that till September. Uh, and that's an unemployment's growing. There's all sorts of people on sort of make work type situation, which could very rapidly come to an end in that. So it's, it could be very sharp recession here. En relación a la situación económica, ¿cuáles han sido las medidas que ha tomado el gobierno de Morrison y cuál ha sido la postura del Partido Laborista? Well, they put in initially a major bailout package Uh, to try to prop up industry and paying uh, bosses huge subsidies and so on. So it's a large package, obviously overwhelmingly bent towards big business interests and not the interests of working class people. So work, But workers have got some benefit from it in terms of unemployment benefit and so on. The Labor opposition has provided very little opposition. Essentially, Australia's... Um, in a sense, had a, a national government in many ways. Like in Australia, the state... Local state governments are quite important, and in terms of the health system, the, the hospital system, and that, and the education system is controlled by the state governments. And Labor is in government of the state in a number of the major states. 
and, and that and that and so there's effectively been a coalition between Labor and the Liberals, the Conservative Party, and the unions have gone along with that. And the unions have played a very bad role in containing things, you know, negotiating agreements to allowing employers to cut wages and penalty rates, agreeing to mass sackings and so on uh, and that. So this has not been a good situation there. So on one hand, they've done reasonably well so far in containing the virus. On the other hand, there's been massive attacks on basic working class conditions. And I think that's set to get worse. Uh, and that is, you know, the, the, they're all talking about, well, we've put this ballot package in for a while, but then, you know, in six months' time, well, we're going to have to pay for this. And, you know, things are going to change. And all, you know, the signals being sent, sent for an all out assault on working class living standards. Hemos visto que se han desarrollado algunas luchas. ¿Nos podrías contar sobre esto y cuál ha sido más en general la respuesta de la clase trabajadora ante esta nueva situación? Um, well, first of all, on the university sector, as I said, this has been very severely hit economically because so much of the funding of the universities, the, the, the universities are state-owned, but a lot they run very much on a commercial basis and depending heavily on fees charged to international students, you know, massive cutback in, in their finances and the government's refused to bail them out. So the university administrations are looking to make major cutbacks. And unfortunately, the union, which on paper is the left-wing union, a lot of the leaders of it are former members of socialist or revolutionary organisations. So on paper, the sort of union that will pass, you know, nice sounding policies on, you know, refugees or social issues on climate change and so on, but industrially very weak. And that they've pretty much gone begging to the bosses and offering their members up, you know, to take uh, wage cuts, to take redundancies and so on and that. So our members and you know, various uh, people around us and other more active and more militant members of the union have tried to wage a no campaign against this agreement, which the union officials are negotiating with the university management and that which would allow uh, extensive cutbacks. So, so there's been an ongoing fight and a number of the better organised sections of the union We've managed to get through uh, motions, through branch committees, members meetings, uh, meetings of casual staff and so on, to reject um, um, and call for a no vote to the agreement when it comes. One of the things the government's done, they pushed through legislation uh, to make it possible to have an, you have an enterprise agreement, they call them, uh, and that where the bosses can come to you now under the new legislation passed because of the virus and say, you've got to vote on this and you've only got one day notice and that, and everybody can vote. Uh, in Australia, the case is that it's not like in America where it's not everybody's in the union if it's unionised. Here, it's, it's, it's open. So you might have at a workplace 10%, 20%, 30% of people in the union, but who vote on this agreement would be everybody union members and non-union members with, with one day's notice and so on to wage cuts. So a very uh, heavy attack, which the unions have done nothing serious to oppose uh, and that. More broadly on the unions, though, if you move away, uh, it's been pretty appalling. Like some of the more right-wing unions have explicitly gone out, negotiated agreements for amongst, say, shop assistants, uh, agreeing to cuts to wages. And in the more supposedly more militant unions, in the construction industry and so on, unions which historically were run by the Communist Party or Maoists and so on, they've forced construction workers to stay at work and that the union. The officials would say, oh, I can't come onto the site because of health considerations, but our members should still go to work uh, and all that uh, and that. So a very bad role generally. Hemos visto también la lucha de los refugiados. ¿Nos podrías contar un poco sobre esto? ¿Y sobre cuál ha sido el papel de Australia en la región a partir de la pandemia? Australia uh, offloaded most of the refugees that were coming in. So there was refugees coming in by boat. You know, they, they were turning back boats back and they sent them to offshore islands like Nauru um, or to Papua New Guinea. Some refugees, uh, for various reasons, for health reasons, were flown to Australia for a treatment. And they've been stuck in uh, either detention centres here or put up in very shoddy conditions uh, in hotels 
uh, where they're not protected from the virus, they're crowded in together and so on, and they've been protesting, and, and there's been protests outside them, uh, which are limited, obviously, by the virus and because it's illegal to have these protests now. Arrests of people, uh, a bit, very big fines, $1,600 fines on people who came out to uh, protest and so on. Uh, and that. So that's been gone going. And there's more demonstrations possibly coming up this weekend. More broadly in the region, you know, like Australia sort of, you know, had colonies in the area and runs a sort of um, a neo-colonial, you know, mini empire in the surrounding area. You know, many of the workers who come in from the small islands and that come here to pick fruit and uh, harvest goods and so on on temporary visas. Australia has been increasingly worried about Chinese penetration into the area and China providing funds and development projects and so on. So, uh, you know, Australia very much sees that as a threat, sees this area as our backyard. Because of that, put a certain amount of money in, Australia and New Zealand, a uh, certain amount of money in to do to safeguard, you know, the health of these areas, but very much as protection against uh, growing Chinese in influence in the area and that. Te cambio un minutito de tema. Antes de la pandemia, las fotos de los incendios en, en Australia recorrieron el mundo eh, y se transformaron en un símbolo de la barbarie capitalista. ¿Nos podrías contar cómo sigue la lucha ambiental y, y qué es lo que están haciendo los movimientos ambientalistas? The fires were eventually brought under control and that, as you said, quite some quite impressive demonstrations um, and people were shocked uh, and it brought home the reality of what climate change could be, you know, with like even though the big cities weren't engulfed by fires, there was for days, in, for example, in Sydney, there was smoke hanging over, which was bad for people's health and so on. So, you know, so it was quite a development for the movement and, you know, our comrades played a quite impressive role in the more radical side of the movement. As the fires were brought under control, that took some of the impetus out of the movement. And now it's all been overwhelmed by the pandemic and so on. Um, so the issue is there, but still, and you'd expect as the, you know, later in the year, uh, in spring and coming into summer, we'll see more fires and so on. So, you know, that'll add to the crisis. So we're going to combine the thing. There's going to be the ongoing pandemic an economic crisis and so on. And then, you know, very much will well be a resurgence of fires and all that. So the movement, I think, will going to come back. It's just, you know, in hibernation for the moment. Um, our comrades have tried to, you know, have various initiatives with online sort of protests to try to keep the flag flying as you like, but it has been overwhelmed by the pandemic and the economic crisis for the moment. ¿Nos podrías contar en estos meses de pandemia cuál ha sido el papel de la izquierda en general y de alternativa socialista en particular? Depends what you want to define as the left uh, and that like there's not there's no labor left of any significance. Um, there's a left in the unions, but as I've said, the left in the unions has played a very bad role and that um, and and not standing up at all and not demarcating themselves you know they make occasional statements that are better uh, but in terms of mobilizing and galvanizing workers you know there was one or two strikes and that but that's receded now um, so they largely gone along with things then you've got a greens party uh, which in formal policy terms is to the left of the labor party and that uh, and a lot of what it says is formally uh, correct and you, know, you could agree to it, but it doesn't mobilise people. It's overwhelmingly electorally oriented and electorally oriented only and that and doesn't have uh, an orientation really to the working class. That, that a lot of people, a lot of white collar workers and young people would, who are workers would vote for it, but it doesn't have a mobilising capacity either amongst workers, doesn't organise in the unions, and it's not a, it doesn't organise protests and mass movement activities. Um, and then you've got uh, the socialist forces. Uh, you know, we're the biggest of the socialist or Marxist revolutionary organisations. Um, you know, you're limited in terms of your public external activity, you know, in terms of protests and demonstrations and so on by the virus. Uh, we've been active in um, the tertiary education union. Uh, and that where there's a bit more of a struggle going on. Our worker members 
have in other areas, you know, have been active in their workplaces in raising issues about health and safety in the schools, um, in various building sites and so on. You can find, you know, a resonance for your arguments there and that there's that side of it. A lot of our activity has been, you know, well, we've had to adjust to a totally new situation working overwhelmingly online and that and in that sense i think we've done very well ourselves we've sort of put more, more effort into upgrading our website our publications like red flag which you referred to we've held a lot of uh online forums and so on which have had a quite a good response we've been able to uh continue you know the campuses are shut down so in terms of our student work at the level of on the campuses, you know, there's nothing on campus itself, but our student members have been able to engage in activity for, by the National Student Union and so on, online activity, and we've continued to meet people and that. So I think our presence in terms of uh, our reach um, has uh, grown uh, and that, so that's been positive. We've continued to recruit, we've got people around us, and uh, we're sort of waiting till we can get out there and you know get back on the streets and and do things but realizing that should be a few months away and that we feel pretty positive about the situation like australia wasn't you know anywhere near badly hit by the by the global financial crisis of, of 2008 compared to other countries it survived them a lot better this time there's a major economic hit and that means the massive working class people and young people in australia haven't experienced this before so this is a real shake-up and all that. That's going to take a time for people to work its way through. But, you know, I think the world is very much changing. One of the changes that are being produced is an agudization of the disputes between China and the United States. Can you tell us how this impacts this in the region? How do you see the conflict and its dynamic? OK, well, Australia has been a very you know, loyal ally of America you know, since the Second World War and that. Before that, you know, socially, uh, you know, very closely associated with Britain and that. So, you know, that is still the, the general orientation of the political establishment, the military apparatus and so on. But it's complicated because Australia is main trading partner now is China, and that's been so for a long period of time. Australia is a major supplier of iron ore, coal, and other commodities to China, uh, and that. And so a series of the capitalists in the mining sector are pro-China, uh, and that, and don't, you know, and, and anti-Trump, uh, and so on. And, you know, parrot the Chinese line, uh, and that. So, but but they are still not, even though they're, you know important capitalists, they're not the do dominant force in the situation. On the other hand, I think the political establishment would like to be in the in the American camp, but they don't want to upset China too much because of the trade situation. And they're very skeptical of Trump. You know, they'd be much happier with you know, if Obama was back or and that uh, and that. So that, that complicates things for them. And there's been, you know, and the ruling class here even though Morrison at some level, for a period, sort of used some of the rhetoric of Trump, this is not the way they've gone in terms of the crisis uh, and, and that. And, and it's significant. There's no, you know, there's nothing equivalent uh, to in, in America where you've got the right-wing movement on the streets, you know, protesting and so on. There was a couple of smallish right-wing demonstrations against the lockdown and so on. But it was notable, for example, the difference is here in Victoria at the weekend, there was a right-wing demonstration of a couple of thousand against the lockdown. The police went in and smashed it up uh, and arrested a number of people and physically broke it up. That's the state Labor government's police. You know, they're not going along with these people at all. So it's a different approach that way. And in some senses, the Australian ruling class think now America's unreliable uh, now and even though we're a small country of 25 million, they think, well, we've got to be a bit more independent. They don't want to be in either camp. They'll be you know, basically pro-American. Maybe if Biden gets in, they'll patch things up more and so on. But it creates a complicated situation. And they're trying to, you know, reach out to other uh, countries in the region uh, to more form a block against China with them. 
and that and be, you know, they don't want to offend America, but on the other hand, they don't want to offend China too much either. Es evidente que la pandemia y la crisis económica está produciendo todo tipo de nuevos fenómenos y un gran debate es hacia dónde va el mundo. ¿Cómo ven ustedes la perspectiva de la situación mundial a partir de todo lo que está pasando? Well, it's obviously a tremendous upset in world capitalism. You know, coming on top, when you think going into this crisis, the world economy uh, was pretty stagnant anyhow, a long-term uh, crisis, you know, not a full recovery from the uh, global financial crisis, uh, and that and that, that was the case anyhow. Uh, the um, climate, you know, crisis was growing and becoming more intensified, and now we have the pandemic and the shock Uh, that goes with that. Uh, a serious recession was probably going to come anyhow and that, but now it's been brought on by this. So th I think this is a, a major turning point, a major rupture for world capitalism. It'll be uneven how it affects particular countries, but I mean, it is significant. You know, this is a huge crisis in America. The largest imperialist power, you know, is being really much racked by this crisis, you know, huge death toll, huge level of unemployment and so on, and, and that, you know, at the centre of world capitalism. And then a whole series of other capitalist powers, major European powers, whether it's France or Britain, uh, or Italy and so on, Spain, you know, tremendously impact, impacted both at the health crisis and the economic crisis. So this is a huge turning point. And now, of course, it's gradually starting to flow through into the poorer countries, whether it's Africa, um, you know, a whole series of countries in Asia like Pakistan and Bangladesh and so on, which is going to ravage those countries uh, and that. I mean, obviously the death toll has been massively under, uh, understated. We don't know what the real toll is. So you'd expect, you know, so a series of countries where you think over the last year or 18 months, there's been major upheavals and struggles. They've been, you know, to some extent pushed back Uh, by the crisis and so on. But, you know, I think they're going to resurface. And in a lot of countries, you know, working class people just can't stay in lockdown week after week, month after month. We've seen the protests in Lebanon and so on. You know, what's the, the choices between the virus or starving to death? So, you know, we can expect to see uh, flare-ups. We can expect to see riots and, you know, there's potential famine. So I think a period of tremendous upheaval which really makes revolutionary politics clear, Marxist politics very important. Uh, after a long, in the Western countries, after a long period of retreat by the left, you know, there's uh, a, a very important opportunities of struggles. You know, that you've seen the wildcat strikes in America and so on, which is a very positive sign. Uh, but to relate to that, you know, I think we've got to take a very clear standpoint, you know, that, um, more reformist currents like the Democratic Socialists of America and so on, you know, that politics is not going to be relate, able to relate to it and take the struggles forward, you know. We're going to have to have a fighting stance, a, a stance that's going to stand against, you know, I mean, the reformist parties, it's not just in Australia where the Labour Party's played an appalling role in this crisis. It's country after country in Europe. In Britain now, you know, the Corbyn phenomena ended in, you know, bad failure. The Labour Party shifted markedly to the right and so on. So the, the reformist parties, you know, are very much propping up the system. So the need to build a revolutionary alternative in country after country with genuine fighting policies, a clear, you know, anti-capitalist perspective, I think that becomes more and more important. Uh, and that, and, you know, galvanising those forces, making those arguments becomes very important. You know, I think Australia is not going to be the first place to move, you know, living standards of working class people are better here and that. There's been, a rupt on the other hand, a rupture. So we're confident in the coming period that our organisation can grow and that, and there will be struggles. But I think that we, in other countries, you know, you know, in Africa or Asia, you know, maybe parts of Latin America, I think we can see potentially revolutionary upheavals and that. Um, and some of those battles, of course, will be major ruptures will be lost. I think there's potential for enormous struggles, in other words, a huge rupture uh, and, you know, and the ruling class is going to be carrying through massive attacks uh, and that so there's a real importance to build the revolutionary forces with clear arguments, with confidence that we can go forward, you know, and dedicated movement and that. Por último, Mike, ¿quisieras agregar algo más para todos los compañeros y compañeras que te están viendo? I think I've covered most of it, but, you know, 
Oh, you know, it's the classic situation, isn't it? You know, that it's a huge upheaval in the system. On the other hand, a tragic situation. Millions of lives are going to be lost and that and, and potentially tens of millions. It really gets out of hand in India or Africa and so on. So there's a tragic situation, you know, mass famine, mass unemployment, mass degradation of people. And yet on the other hand, the possibility of enormous struggles. Capitalism goes into crisis. We you know the, the far right can grow, which I didn't mention, in, in a whole series of countries. So, and tremendous potential social polarization and upheavals, and really just shows the need for a social solution to get rid of this whole rotten system. Eso ha sido todo por hoy. Espero que les haya gustado el programa. No se olviden de seguirnos a través de la página web de la Liga Internacional Socialista y de nuestras redes sociales. Hasta la próxima.